Okay, Karen, I'm going to start. Go ahead, Joel. Thanks. Okay, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's Gecko IBD session. It's hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo, University of New Mexico. So uh, Gecko is, of course, run every second Monday at 6 p.m. Um, and, of course, the chat will be open for questions. Even better if you can put your hand up and uh, we can interact in person. So today, um, our presenter is Jillian from KZN, and she's got the and she will testify to the worst topic of all of the topics that I gave out, <laughs> the most complicated one. But it also means that you've learned the most. Okay, so she's going to take us through advanced therapies for IBD. So I don't know if you want to start screen sharing. Okay, and whenever you're ready, you can start. Um, thank you, Prop. Um, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Good evening, colleagues. Um, thank you to the Gastro Foundation and Project ECHO for this platform to discuss our final topic for the year, advanced drugs in inflammatory bowel disease. Also, a big thank you to Prof. Watermeyer for her guiding hand in the preparation for today's talk. So as an introduction, um, we know that there is currently no cure for inflammatory bowel disease. And the therapeutic objective is to control the inflammatory process and reduce the risks associated with uncontrolled disease. This, however, is not easy because, as we know, multiple inflammatory pathways are concurrently activated in the intestinal mucosa of patients with IBD, and the pathogenic mechanisms sustaining that inflammation are dynamic. In our previous fellows meeting, we heard about conventional treatments for IBD. These drugs, even though um, introduced several decades ago, they are still effective treatment for most patients. However, um, failure of first-line therapy is an unfortunate lived reality for many patients. And as a result, there has been an expansion of treatment options. The so-called advanced drugs that have emerged include biologics and small molecules. And I hope this talk today provides a foundation to build on because as you can see, the landscape of advanced drugs in IBD is an ever expanding one. This timeline from a post by Professor Charlie Lee on his Twitter page is the most up-to-date one I could find. It shows biologics in green, small molecules in red, biosimilars in italics below, and late stage development drugs in light gray. So since that 1997 report on the use of infliximab in patients with Crohn's disease, um, and with an improved understanding of the complex pathogenesis of IBD, we see this explosion of new drugs that have precise molecular targeting. Let's take a closer look at these drugs. Advanced drugs are classified into biologics, which are monoclonal antibodies, or MABs as I've labeled in here, um, and then you have small molecules, which include the JAK inhibitors and the S1Q receptor modulators, labeled here as the NIBs and the MODs. Biologics are small and small molecules have key differences, with biologics uh, being complex structures that require IV or subcutaneous administration to prevent uh, proteolytic gastrointestinal digestion. They have a long half-life, which is great for patient compliance, but is a, um, is a disadvantage in the face of an infection or surgery. The other big concern with biologics is immunogenicity, which we will talk about a bit later. Um, whereas with small molecules, they have a generally shorter half-life, a relatively lower cost, and they lack the propensity for immunogenicity. But uh, due to their broader diffusion associated with their smaller size, using them may lead to a greater risk of unspecified side effects. So let's discuss now the three classes of monoclonal antibodies, the MABs. What is TNF-alpha and how do antibodies directed against them work? TNF-alpha is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It plays a pivotal role in the inflammatory cascade that causes chronic intestinal inflammation in IBD. TNF is made intracellularly by activated macrophages. There are two types of TNF. They're close, cl very closely related. You have TNF-alpha and TNF-beta. And the activities of both TNFs are mediated through binding to the TNF receptor 1 and 2, which are present on almost all cell types. And it is that binding of TNF to its receptor 
that activates several signaling pathways within the target cells, leading to the release of multiple cytokines that ultimately contribute to the perpetuation of inflama inflammation and immune response within the gut. Synthetic anti-TNF antibodies mitigate this inflammatory process by neutralizing TNF-alpha signaling. They also induce apoptosis of TNF-alpha producing cells via direct, indirect, and FC-dependent apoptosis with an overall modulation of the immune system and a reduction in the production of downstream pro-inflammatory cytokines. They are currently Four TNF alpha agonist drugs approved in IBD. Infliximab is a recombinant chimeric IgG1 monoclonal antibody. It's produced by cell culture from Chinese hamster ovary cells. The half life of this antibody is approximately 8 to 10 days, whereas adalumumab is a fully human recombinant IgG1 monoclonal antibody and has a longer half life than infliximab and is given subcutaneously. Both of these are approved in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So telusimab pegol is a humanized, pegylated fab fragment of an antibody and it's directed against TNF-alpha. It's approved for use in Crohn's disease only. Golumimab is a recombinant, completely humanized IgG1 monoclonal antibody with a higher affinity and neutralizing potency towards the soluble form of TNF-alpha. And it's used in ulcerative colitis only. So given local availability of infliximab and adalumimab, we will discuss these two uh, with further detail. Infliximab is approved for use in refractory or steroid dependent Crohn's disease, where we talk about efficacy in Crohn's disease. Um, the evidence coming from three landmark phase three randomized control trials that confirmed infliximab to be more efficacious than placebo in inducing and maintaining remission in moderate to severe active luminal Crohn's disease. Um, adalumumab also achieved primary endpoints of clinical remission in phase two studies. Um, these studies included both TNF naive and experienced patients, allowing adalumumab to be used um, as a second TNF agonist when infliximab has failed. So, in these initial or early trials, um, they noted coincidental healing of intracutaneous fistulae. Um, and that led to separate successful randomized control trials. Um, to assess infliximab specifically um, for the purpose of uh, fistula healing in Crohn's disease. So it is important to note that infliximab is the only biologic to be studied in clinical trials where the primary endpoint was fistula healing. Various post hoc analysis of other biologics have suggested efficacy, but were not specifically powered or designed for the indication of fistula healing. Maintenance therapy with anti-TNFs may be helpful in resolving extraintestinal manifestations, particularly arthritis and arthralgia, with several prospective open-label trials demonstrating improvement in peripheral arthritis in patients who are refractory to conventional drugs. Cutaneous manifestations like erythema nodosum and pyoderma gangrenosum in many cases are refractory and um, to standard treatment, and efficacy of infliximab over placebo has been demonstrated in, randomized, in a randomized control trial of 30 patients with pyoderma with the response rate of 46% versus 6% for placebo. One should always consider early biologic use. Um, almost 20% of patients with Crohn's disease experience penetrating or stricturing complications within 90 days of diagnosis, whereas half of the patients will eventually experience these complications 20 years down the line. So the current treat to target strategies aim to avoid these long-term complications. And this concept of a therapeutic window of opportunity in early Crohn's disease is, is growing, <coughs> excuse me, where biologics are introduced as early as possible, particularly in patients with the high-risk phenotype. Um, these include younger patients, smokers, and those with fistulizing and extensive disease. In terms of TNF-alpha agonist efficacy in ulcerative colitis, results from the ACT-1 and ACT-2 phase 3 trials showed efficacy of infliximab therapy in UC. In the ULTRA-2 study, when um, assessing efficacy of adalumumab for UC, patients were stratified according to TNF exposure, and the difference in remission and response rates were larger in patients naive to anti-TNF therapy. Early use of anti-TNF agents after failure of conventional treatments is preferable to a gradual step-up regimen, particularly if there is high risk for a colectomy. 
clinical predictors of the likely need for colectomy are in, patient, in patients with UC include extensive disease, the need for corticosteroids, non-smoking status, and the need for hospitalization. Infliximab is the only anti-TNF agent with robust data to support its use as rescue therapy in steroid non-responders with acute severe ulcerative colitis. Um, immunogenicity is recognized as a leading contributor to the loss of response um, to biologic therapies. As we mentioned, biologic agents are large, complex proteins. proteins. They trigger the formation of anti-drug antibodies specific to that agent. Um, humanized monoclonal antibodies produce fewer anti-drug antibodies than the chimeric ones. And as you can appreciate from this systematic review, looking at the immunogenicity of biologics, in 74 studies with infliximab use, anti-drug antibodies were between 0 and 65.3%, whereas in the 23 studies with adalumumab, which is the humanized um, antibody, uh, so monoclonal antibody, the anti-drug antibodies were lower at 0.3% to 38%. Apart from medication biology, other factors can contribute to the formation of anti-drug antibodies, such as frequency of medication administration, the root of drug metabolism, and factors uh, intrinsic to the patient, like their genetics or concurrent medication interactions. So a way to decrease the chances of immunogenicity is to add an immunomodulator as combination therapy. ECHO recommends combination therapy with the thiopurine when starting in fliximab. This recommendation is based on findings from the SONIC trial in Crohn's disease and the SUCCESS trial in ulcerative colitis, where combination therapy was found to be superior to monotherapy in achieving steroid-free clinical remission in their respective cohorts. The same, unfortunately, was not true in the DIAMOND study when assessing adalumumab and as a diaprene combination therapy versus adalumumab monotherapy in patients with Crohn's. Um, the targets were not met in both the intention to treat and per protocol analysis. And given these findings and the overall reduced um, in immunogenicity with adalumumab, ECHO guidelines recommend adalumumab monotherapy. It's important to remember um, the compounding safety concerns when using combination therapy. One should rather opt for monotherapy in patients with previous severe adverse effects or intolerance to immunomodulators, older individuals more than 65 years of age, patients with increased risk or have had a previous history of lymphoma or other malignancies, and then also in young males who are EBV negative and are at risk of primary infection and death from primary hepato T cell, hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. The, do, the data supporting the use of methotrexate in combination with an anti-TNF agent is less robust, but it can be considered if thiopurines are contraindicated. So given the fact that 30% of patients are non-responders to anti-TNFs and 40% lose response over time, uh, with immunogenicity being a significant contributor to this, Therapeutic drug monitoring can be used to assist with the appropriate, to help appropriately um, use anti-TNF agents. Reactive uh, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is used to assess primary non-response or at any point when secondary non-response is identified. Drug truck levels should be drawn as close to the next dose as possible. The exact targets of drug truck levels are, are a bit uncertain and they continue to evolve. Nevertheless, if a patient has active disease and they have therapeutic or uh, supra-therapeutic trap levels, then one should actually consider switching drug classes. Um, if there are sub-therapeutic uh, trap levels, then um, the clinician would need to check anti-drug antibodies. And if these are low, if the anti-drug antibodies are low, then one can consider dose escalation, increase the dose frequency, or add an immunomodulator to patient is old, or if the patient is not already on one. Alternatively, if, if there are high levels of anti-drug antibodies, one can consider switching um, drug class. So anti-TNFs are approved for a number of inflammatory conditions apart from IVD and has over 20 years of robust safety data. As you can see from the slide, there are many safety concerns with anti-TNFs but it's important to mention that the safety profile of anti-TNFs 
is considered acceptable in relation to the benefits associated with disease control, as well as in relation to side effects of long-term steroid use. Um, however, there does remain significant concerns, particularly regarding infection and malignancy. The most common opportunistic infection is reactivation of TB. This is thought to relate to the role that TNF has in the formation of granulomas. Reactivation rates of TB during anti-TNF use has been found to be about 1.5 events per 100 case, uh, patient years, but this rate has improved since uh, label warnings that require testing and treatment of uh, latent TB infection prior to initiation. All anti-TNFs include black box warnings for malignancy. Um, however, how much of that risk is from the inflammation itself or the concurrent or prior use of immunomodulators, that remains unclear. There has been a trend towards increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancer in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and increased lymphoma risk in IBD patients. Other um, side effects or safety concerns are, are noted on the slide. So the second class of biologic agents that has proven effective in IBD are the anti-integrant agents. Let's look a little closer at how exactly they work. So during an inflammatory response, circulating leukocytes migrate to target tissues through a homing process that takes place in several stages. So they begin first, as you can see there on the top, um, they begin by rolling to uh, tethering and rolling to the specific place, then they arrest and they adhere to the vascular endothelial cells where they finally undergo trans-endothelial migration to the site of inflammation. This process of leukocyte migration is mediated by interactions between the leukocytes with the expressed CAMs, which are also called integrins, and the adhesion molecules expressed by the endothelial cells. So integrins are formed uh, from an alpha and beta subunit and different populations of leukocytes express different integrins. Um, some examples include alpha-4, beta-1 uh, integrin, which is found on most leukocytes, um, and these bind to the VCAM1 adhesion molecule. Alpha-4, beta-7, which is found specifically on lymphocytes in the gastrointestinal tract, binds to MADCAM1 adhesion molecule. And alpha E beta 7 is found um, on intraepithelial T cells, dendritic cells, mast cells, and regulatory T cells, and that binds to E cadherin. So in IBD, you've got an increased expression of integrins. And anti integrin therapies block the action of integrins, um, and thereby they decrease the trafficking of immune cells to the site of inflammation. Currently approved anti-integrins include natalizumab and vedoluzumab. Natalizumab is a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody, um, the first agent in class for anti-integrins, that non-specifically blocks alpha-4 integrins. So both alpha-4 beta-1 and alpha-4 beta-7 are inhibited. It therefore reduces leukocyte traffic in the brain and the gut, among other organs. As a result, natalizumab has been approved in, in both uh, multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease. Um, enthusiasm for natalizumab was quickly diminished because of uh, reports of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML, from reactivation of the JC virus. And this resulted in the medication being temporarily pulled off the market because uh, of these concerns, but later FDA approved it with black box warning. And it is still approved for treatment in Crohn's disease, but its use has um, significantly, um, sorry, significantly decreased. Vedoluzumab, on the other hand, specifically targets and blocks alpha-4 beta-7 um, that is found primarily on cells in the GI tract, as I mentioned, as well as the biliary system. And it was the first biologic designed exclusively for um, inflammatory bowel disease. The safety issues um, related to PML are not seen with VEDO, and it is approved for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So VEDO is indicated for induction and maintenance in patients with moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and it, it can be used in TNF-experienced or TNF-naive patients. Um, phase 3 efficacy data comes from the Gemini series with Gemini 1 
evaluated vedolizumab in patients with, uh, with ulcerative colitis, and it showed excellent efficacy compared to placebo, achieving response and remission rates more than 40%. Gemini 2 and 3 looked at vedo in Crohn's disease, with an overall benefit in Crohn's less striking than in UC. Um, the rates of response were also higher in anti-TNF naive compared to anti-TNF failure patients. Um, interestingly, um, studies in ulcerative colitis have shown that Vido has a significantly longer persistence than infliximab as a first-line biologic agent. And when it is used first, it does not disadvantage second-line infliximab use. But on the other hand, Vido after infliximab is associated with significantly poorer persistence. So there is some advocacy at the moment for Vido. To, to be considered as the first line biologic agent of choice uh, for patients in ulcerative colitis. Results from the Ernest trial found VEDO to be more effective than placebo in inducing remission in patients with chronic pouchitis. And we know VEDO is not recommended for use in acute severe UC, nor has a role in fistulizing Crohn's. Given its gut selectivity, it also has no benefit in extraintestinal manifestations. In fact, there, are some, there is some evidence that VEDO can induce de novo um, extraintestinal manifestations. However, um, further prospective research is needed um, in this regard. So given the gut selectivity of VEDO, the safety profile is great. Common side effects include nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infections, arthralgia, abdominal pain, gastrointestinal infections, and transaminase increases. Um, in this integrated, stu integrated study, looking at 2,830 patients taking vedolizumab for a period of up to five years exposure, there was no increased risk of infection, no cases of uh, PML, less than 1% of vedo-exposed patients developed malignancy, and immunogenicity rates were low as well. Then the, the most recent class of biologics available for use in IBD are the anti-interleukins. This class primarily works by blocking extracellular signals that activate and differentiate lymphocytes. So basically, in response to microbial pathogens, antigen-stimulated dendritic cells and macrophages produce interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. These bind to their receptors and they promote differentiation of T helper cells and the release of further cytokines that perpetuate chronic inflammation in the intestinal mucosa. Interleukin-12 and interleukin-23 belong to the interleukin-12 family together with IL-27 and IL-35. The family members differ in their composition of their subunits. So IL-12 consists of the subunit P35 and it shares the subunit P40 with IL-23. And then IL-23 has an additional subunit P19. So while IL-12 and IL-23 are supposed to act both in a pro-inflammatory manner, manner, newer studies suggest that IL-23 is a more potent, uh, pro-inflammatory uh, uh, pro inflammatory fix, whereas IL-12 has a balanced pro- and anti-inflammatory nature. The first generation anti-interleukin drug is tekinumab, which inhibits the P40 subunit, inhibits both IL-12 and IL-23 and is approved for use in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. <clears throat> so regarding efficacy of istekinumab in Crohn's, um, it is indicated for induction and maintenance in, Crohn, in patients with moderate to severe Crohn's who have either failed anti-TNF therapy, they're intolerant, or um, they are biologic naive. Um, istekinumab is shown to be superior to placebo for inducing clinical response and remission, as well as endoscopic and histologic improvement in the phase three unity program. As expected, patients who are biologic naive had higher rates of clinical remission, endoscopic improvement, and histological improvement um, than TNF exposed group. But real world data supports estekinumab as an effective option in anti TNF exposed um, patients. Um, Isokinumab is also indicated for induction and maintenance um, with, in patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis who have either failed anti-TNF therapy, intolerant to it, or they are biologic naive. And in the phase three UNIFI program, Isokinumab was superior to placebo for all endpoints. And um, interestingly, the UNIFI trial was the first trial to use histoendoscopic definitions 
or mucosal healing as an endpoint. Um, the incidence of antibodies to estekinumab is low. Um, this was seen in the phase three unity long term extension study. Um, they were found to be low regardless of concomitant immunosuppressive therapy use. And estekinumab should also be considered for extraintestinal manifestations. The drug is approved for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So it would be a good drug of choice in IBD patients who have comorbid psoriasis, as well as those um, with psoria form eruptions from anti TNF therapy. Those with anti TNF induced alopecia may also benefit from a switch uh, to estekinumab. And estekinumab actually did not show efficacy in ankylosing spondylitis, unlike the um, anti TNF therapies. So given the preclinical data that shows IL-23 to be a more potent driver of in inflammation than IL-12, there's been consider considerable interest in developing selective IL-23 therapies that offer all the benefits of anti-IL-12-23 P40 therapies with less off-target uh, effects from inhibition of IL-12 signaling. This year has seen the selective anti-IL-23 risenkizumab approved for Crohn's disease based on two induction trials, Advanced and Motivate, and a maintenance trial, Fortify, where superiority over placebo was achieved for all endpoints. And then another selective anti-IL-23 drug, mirikizumab, has been approved for use in ulcerative colitis. Um, interestingly, a subset of these patients had actually failed um, estekinumab therapy, and they were included in, in these phase three trials. Head-to-head um, -head psoriasis trials have actually shown um, that the selective IL-23 therapy was superior, had superior efficacy compared to um, estekinumab. And I think we can be optimistic about the potential for these selective IL-23 therapies, however additional studies are, are needed. The safety profile of estekinumab as well is, is excellent. One decade of uh, safety data from the Solar Registry, which is a cohort of over 12,000 patients in rheumatoid uh, study in psoriasis. Um, and this um, registry suggested that estekinumab is not associated with an increased risk of cancer, major adverse cardiovascular events, serious infection, or death. And although there are no head-to-head -head trials comparing safety, amongst the various biologic categories. Overall safety data is favorable for serious uh, adverse events with isokinumab compared to the anti-TNF agents. And this has been seen in various network meta-analysis studies. Um, there's also, it's also seen that there is a lower rate of serious infection and tuberculosis um, that's been observed with isokinumab. So what about biologic use in general in pregnancy? Um, in this systematic review published in Clinical Gastro and Hepatology, um, it was looking at biologics for IBD and their safety in pregnancy. Uh, 48 studies were included, compromising 6,963 patients, and adverse pregnancy outcomes among the pregnant IBD women using biologics were comparable to that of the general population. So continued TNF inhibitor therapy throughout the third trimester was also seen to not be associated with increased risk of preterm birth, low birth weight, or congenital malformations compared with um, discontinuing biologics early on in pregnancy. So I think this is reassuring uh, data for both patients and doctors. I just thought I'd mention this as well, given the various safety concern, concerns with biologics. Um, a practical ap approach for pre-biologic screening and monitoring would be by way of using a checklist approach, um, just to help us to remember to, to check and to uh, verify vaccination status of patients, make sure that baseline screening, biochemical uh, screening has been performed. Many institutions have their own, but um, I just thought it important to mention this, uh, that as something to use when, when managing our patients. Now moving on to the small molecules, JAK inhibitors. Um, so what is the jak stat pathway? How does it work? Essentially, various cytokines like IL-12, 23, that we just discussed, various cytokines, they bind to the cell surface receptors, um, and these receptors undergo conform con conformational changes, and then the two JAKs become approximated, 
So the paired jacks and their receptor then undergo um, phosphorylation in step two, which allows the stats to then bind to the receptor. And then the activated jacks then phosphorylate the doxed stats. And then activated stats then dimerize and migrate to the nucleus where they act um, as transcription factors, they bind DNA, they regulate gene transcription, and they increase levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then this drives the chronic cycle of inflammation. So Janus kinase inhibitors are oral small molecules that provide rapid onset of action. And what they do is they interrupt the at step three by um, inhibiting phosphorylation and activation of the stats. They do this by competing with ATP for the ATP binding site and essentially shutting off everything that happens downstream, um, thereby reducing um, inflammation. Sorry. Um, the JAK family consists of four members. You've got JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and TIC2. These transmit various cytokine signals through different combinations of the JAKs, which will eventually signal through the six stat protein. So as you can see um, in this region here, all the, the different cytokines that transmit through the JAKs, um, the notable exception in terms of uh, cytokine signaling via the JAK stat pathway is TNFs. So you can see there's no TNFs that go through the JAK pathway. And this is probably why JAK inhibitors work well in patients who have failed um, anti-TNFs. Um, the different JAK inhibitors, um, there's a few at the top here. The first three have been approved in um, IBD. Um, so the different JAK inhibitors have different potency towards the individual JAK isoforms. So you have tofacitinib and plan Sorry? Oh. You have tofacitinib here at the top, um, which covers JAK1, JAK2, um, and 3, or more so than TIC2, um, making it a pan-JAK inhibitor. Whereas uh, upadacitinib and fulgotinib, you can see here, only um, are specific JAK1 inhibitors. They are much more selective for JAK1. But it's also important to mention that at higher doses, all the molecules have the ability to target all the JAK isoforms, even the highly specific JAK1 inhibitors, because JAK1 will always form a heterodimeric pair with JAK3, JAK2, and TIC2. So um, that's, I thought, important to mention. Um, so tofacitinib, um, as well as the selective JAK1 inhibitors, fulgotinib and opadacitinib, met uh, primary endpoints in their phase three trials and are approved in moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. Uh, patients who have had an inadequate response, intolerance uh, to conventional therapy, and have failed anti-TNF agents. Um, in the in the upadacitinib trials, there were there was much more stringent definitions of remission that were used um, compared to other trials, and also the criteria for mucosal healing required both endoscopic and histological remission. Um, and even despite this, the induction uh, remission rates were between 26 and 34 percent. So JAK inhibitors uh, may be a viable second line option in patients with um, extra intestinal manifestations as well. Phase three studies showed um, the effectiveness of tofacitinib over placebo in ankylosing, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, tofacitinib has also been successfully used to treat refractory uveitis, scleritis, and pyodermal ganglionosa. The other great thing about JAK inhibitors is that they work very fast. So um, in the one trial, paracetinib 45 milligrams were shown to improve symptoms as early as day one, uh, providing patients with very fast symptom relief. Even bowel urgency, which is often quite a debilitating symptom for patients, um, you could see separation from placebo very early on. Um, similar findings were noted in the tofacitinib studies with improvements in symptoms as early as day three. So this rapid response has led to off-label use of tofacitinib in acute severe ulcerative colitis in patients who have previously failed biologics and require rescue treatment. This trial from North America enrolled 40 biologic experienced patients with acute severe colitis requiring rescue therapy. The patients were given 10 milligrams three times a day um, of tofacitinib for three days, and that group had a significant reduction in colectomy rates, only 8%, compared to standard tofacitinib dosing, 
as well as uh, conventional treatments. So there are two ongoing prospective open la label studies, the Triumph and the Tocosa studies that should provide further evidence for uh, JAK inhibitors use in acute severe ulcerative colitis. So what about JAK inhibitors in Crohn's disease? So tofacitinib um, testing for Crohn's was stopped after the phase two trials failed to meet primary endpoints. And then fulgotinib met efficacy targets in phase two Fitzroy study, but it failed to meet uh, primary targets in the phase three diversity trial. Um, so currently the only JAK inhibitor approved for use in Crohn's disease is upadacitinib. Uh, the two induction studies, U Endure and U Exceed, as well as the maintenance trial, sorry, U Excel, U Exceed were the induction studies, and then U Endure was the maintenance study that was published in the NEJM um, earlier this year. They found uh, week 52 remission rates were very high, up to 46% in the 30 milligram um, opatacitinib comparison with placebo. They also noted a rapid onset of action in clinical response compared to placebo as early as two weeks. And I think this is good news for patients with refractory Crohn's who now have the availability of an oral agent with very good efficacy. But, <laughs> so JAK inhibitors do come with a number of safety concerns. Um, as you can see, regarding um, elevations in cholesterol, one can actually see reversible rise in lipids in the first six weeks of therapy. However, it has been shown that Usually, this stabilizes by week uh, between weeks four to eight and can return to baseline once stopping the treatment. There was a pooled analysis of five UC trials that showed elevations in uh, total cholesterol, HDL, and LDL, um, which were actually counterbalanced by reductions in CRP, and that uh, suggesting to the examiners an overall net low cardiovascular risk. So, even though the cholesterol went up, the CRP came down and and it didn't really add to cardiovascular risk. But the recommendation is that all patients should have baseline fasting lipid profiles at four to eight weeks and then six monthly. And if persistent elevations are seen, especially in the context of other cardiovascular risk factors, lipid lowering agents should be started. They also noted in the, in the studies, the Jack and Hibitzer studies, um, that there was a dose dependent two to six fold increase in um, herpes zoster infection. Um, and the rationale for this is based on blocking of type 1 and type 2 interferon pathways. Most of the cases, however, were uncomplicated. They were associated with a single dermatome. Um, and they found that patients at higher risk for zoster were older age, prior anti-TNF use, Asian race, higher drug doses, um, and a prior history of herpes zoster. So the recommendation is to screen for active and latent infection and to vaccinate with the non-live um, Shingrix vaccine, two doses given two to six months apart, and then the JAK inhibitor, JAK inhibitor can be given two weeks after the first dose. Um, important to mention, JAK inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding, and there are other um, safety concerns as, as mentioned. So the black box warning for tofacitinib came from the oral surveillance trial. Um, they enrolled patients with rheumatoid arthritis over the age of 50 years who had, who had at least one cardiovascular risk factor to receive either five milligrams of tofacitinib, 10 milligrams of tofacitinib, or adalumumab. The study was endpoint driven and it looked at major adverse cardiac events as well as malignancy. And they found a higher proportion of both in the tofacitinib treated uh, group of patients. Therefore, the black box recommendation is to give uh, JAK inhibitors only after anti-TNF failure or intolerance. They, may, they say to give the lowest dose during maintenance therapy, that is five milligrams twice a day. And there's a need to stop tofacitinib if there is no response to treatment after 16 weeks. Um, ECHO has since put out a position statement regarding this, essentially stating um, that extrapolating the RA findings to IV patients may not be a, um, appropriate because the prevalence of risk factors are, are different between the two populations. Ulcerative of colitis patients are much, young, much younger, they have lower incidence of comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes. They're often not smokers and therefore they have a lower um, cardiovascular like baseline risk. They also mentioned to date that there were no increased risks of a major adverse cardiac events or malignancy. 
uh, that were identified in the overall tofacitinib treated UC population um, with seven years of follow up. So, but ultimately, um, ECHO does recommend individualizing risk benefit uh, assessment in patients. Um, this risk benefit assessment should be made by the IBD um, specialist when considering um, JAK inhibitors in patients. So finally, we're going to discuss the um, S1P receptor modulators. Um, there has been a growing interest in the development of novel oral small molecule therapies in uh, treatment of IBD. Um, Ozanimod is the first uh, sphingosine 1 phosphate receptor modulator um, that has been approved for treatment of moderately, moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis um, in adult patients. It's essentially the new kid on the block. Um, it may be viewed as a more attractive oral formulation given the current black box warnings with the JAK inhibitors, but we'll see. Um, regarding its mechanism of action, we know that in the pathogenesis of IBD, there is migration of lymphocytes from lymphoid tissues to the intestines where they promote inflammation. So S1P signaling is involved in this uh, lymphocyte tracking. Um, firstly, S1P binds to the S1P1 receptors on lymphocytes, enables them to migrate from the lymphoid tissue into the circulation and then to the sites of inflammation. Then at the sites of inflammation, S1P he is uh, further involved in the recruitment of immune cells, which further exacerbates the inflammatory response. So the enzymatic pathways that control S1P levels are dysregulated and they are altered in the intestinal tissue of patients with IBD. Ozanimod is an S1P receptor modulator that binds uh, with a high affinity to the S1P and the S1, S1P1 and the S1P5 receptor subtypes. And this leads to receptor internalization and reduces the capacity of lymphocytes to egress uh, from the lymphoid tissue. So the, the lymphocytes can't leave the lymphoid tissue. They're essentially blocked from leaving. So in addition to regulating lymphocyte movement, S1P receptors are also important regulators of vascular tone heart rate, and cardiac repolarization. So remember that point because it becomes significant in terms of safety. Um, ozanimod, ozanimod is metabolized into two major active metabolites and several other minor active metabolites, all with similar selectivity for S1P1 and S1P5. The mean half-life of ozanimod is approximately 21 hours. But the metabolites of azanamod have a half-life of about 11 days. So um, therefore, it's important to consider a washout period of up to three months after discontinuing, discontinuing azanamod. So if you stop azanamod, think about that three-month uh, washout period. It might become important when a, if a patient is planning pregnancy or if you're wanting to initiate another immunosuppressant or if you want to give a live attenuated vaccine after stopping as animal. So patients should actually be monitored very closely, also look for infections um, in that washout period. <clears throat> the efficacy data for Ozanimod came from the True North study, where significantly more patients achieved clinical remission during induction and maintenance with Ozanimod compared with the placebo. Importantly, given the cardiovascular regulatory effect, patients were given slow dose escalation and close cardiovascular monitoring during the trial. Um, they found regarding safety that the dose 0 0.92 milligrams is well tolerated. Um, the occurrence of treatment emergent adverse events was similar between ozanimod and placebo during the reduction period, but was slightly higher um, during the maintenance uh, period. Um, there was very uh, low uh, levels of discontinuation of treatment. And because of the prior from previous studies for other indications, and the prior associations that S1P receptor modulation has, the investigators closely looked for adverse events of special interest. Um, and these included cardiac and liver related events, as well as malignancy and infection signals. So like I mentioned, the cardiovascular events were mitigated by gradual dose escalation. And also that uh, patients with significant cardiovascular history were not included in the study. Um, they found bradycardia occurring in five patients. It was self-limiting, did not require any treatment or extended monitoring. 
And in the occurrence of cancer, serious infection, macular edema, they were low uh, with the Zanimod. And only 0.4% patient, of patients had abnormal liver enzymes that led to discontinuation, but excuse me, none met the criteria for um, highs law of significant drug-induced liver injury. Um, also in the True North Open Label Extension Study, with patients having up to three years exposure of the drug, there were no uh, new uh, safety uh, signals that were identified. So the contraindications to Ozanimod are, as can be expected, mostly cardiovascular. Um, these include myocardial infarction, unstable angina, admission with uh, decompensated heart failure in the past six months, also conduction problems like type 2, uh, second degree heart block or third degree AV block, sick sinus syndrome, sinoatrial block, and then stroke and um, TIAs. Um, Ozanimod should not be given in pregnancy and the other contraindications are, are listed. Also baseline screening and periodic uh, monitoring are required. So that brings us to the end of our talk. Um, in conclusion, we can say that this is an exciting time um, in the treatments of IBD um, and we're only actually just beginning. Um, as our understanding of IBD expands, so too does the drug pipeline. And this complex disease offers many challenges, but it's a great opportunity to improve patients' quality of life and their outcomes. There are a number of unanswered questions regarding the best way to position these treatments, but I guess that's a talk for another day. Um, in one breath, I'm very happy about future prospects in IBD care, but I just wish that we had better access in South African state hospitals to these quality of life um, saving medications. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I think we still have a bit of time, but yeah, thanks. Uh, Great, thanks, Jillian. If you want to um, stop sharing, yeah. Okay, perfect. Does anybody have any questions for Jillian? No, okay, well, I'm gonna give, oh wait, something in the chat. Oh, I think that is. Hmm. It's just Sean saying, excellent talk, well done. I agree 100%. There's just a couple of things that you might not know about with your reading, is that mirikizumab has been approved in ulcerative colitis, and itkazimod has also just been approved in ulcerative colitis by the FDA. Okay, so um, you didn't mention much about itrazimod. So itrazimod is it's similar to azanimod, except that it doesn't just bind um, uh, the SP1 uh, and five, but it also binds four, okay? And it has got a couple of advantages over itrazimod in that um, you don't have to dose titrate. With the Xanamod, you've got to titrate the dose up over a week period, and this is because of the risk of um, particularly first dose bradycardia, okay? So um, easier to use in that way. Also, a, another problem with the Xanamod is that because of the mechanism of action, you reduce your lymphocyte counts. That's how it works, okay? So if you have a very profound lymphopenia, which you obviously don't want to have if you have an infectious complication or something, it is actually uh, takes a long time on stopping a Xanamod for the lymphocyte counts to get into the normal range. Okay. If Xanamod, <clears throat> it's a very different story. The lymphocyte counts will return into the normal range much faster. So it likely going to be beneficial both for the bradycardia and for the lymphopenia. Okay, um, right, so we now do have results. You mentioned the psoriasis data um, comparing resankizumab and ustekinumab, and uh, in that particular study, um, resankizumab outperformed ustekinumab. We now have data from the sequence study, which was recently presented at UGW. Again, a direct comparison between resankizumab and ustekinumab in patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. And essentially, resankizumab pretty much outperformed ustekinumab for all of the um, secondary endpoints like clinical remission, endoscopic remission, corticosteroid-free remission at the end of the year. So it's a very, very um, good alternative. I'm not sure if it will replace uh, ustekinumab. Ultimately, with the um, IL-12, IL-23 drugs, it's all about cost because they're actually extremely expensive. And for ustekinumab, it's that loading dose, um, the intravenous loading dose of six milligrams per kilogram that is almost unaffordable. And that <clears throat> is a problem not just for us, but also people in the private sector. So I'm not sure <clears throat> if, if resankizumab could possibly come in cheaper. 
I don't know. But anyway, but we are going to have a um, biosimilar for ustekinimab. I think it will be next year because remember that the drug has been available for psoriasis for much longer than um, its, its approval in IBD. Okay. Um, the S1P receptor modulator. So the very first prototype of these drugs was Fungolimod, which is approved for multiple sclerosis. And one of the things that was concerning in that study, uh, sorry, with that drug, is the risks of aggressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So the risk is exactly as we saw with natalizumab. And the reason is because you've got reduced lymphocytes trafficking into the central nervous system. Because for um, natalizumab, the lymphocytes are, are not there. And for Xanamod, they're trapped in the lymph nodes. Okay, so this allows the John Cunningham JC virus, which is the cause of aggressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, to, to basically go crazy. So you didn't mention it, but there is one report of um, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy with the Xanamod. So one just needs to bear that in mind. Okay, I think so that's all the things. I think you covered everything else pretty well. I did ask Jillian if she could please, uh, she made a, a excellent summaries of all the different um, registration trials, which we just really didn't have time to go through. Um, but I've asked her to make a PDF and send them all to you. I think an excellent summary, and I, I doubt any of you would really need to, to do much further uh, with that. Uh, anything else to add, Jillian? Uh, no, nothing else from my side. Okay. Thanks. Well done. You can be extremely proud of yourself. Okay, so just before I end, thanks so much to Gillian, fantastic work. Um, thanks to Echo University of New Mexico and Echo India uh, team for their support. Of course, thanks to Karen, as always. The recordings will be available on the GI website. And of course, thanks to Chris and the Gastro Foundation. So the next session will be Monday, the 11th of December. Um, that will be with Mashika Sachedi, and it's going to be feedback time. So I think if all of you can put your heads together and see um, what you think can be improved, what you like, what you didn't like, and let her know because she's I know spent a tremendous amount of work putting all of this together and I think she'd really like to know if uh, it's proved successful or not okay so with that uh, thanks everybody have a great evening this is the last IBD one but I will surely see you all again shortly uh, cheers thank you bye-bye thanks everyone see you in two weeks time it's an important session to attend please thanks bye